Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 624. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. Today is October 14, 2020. If you guys see something sneak up behind me, you need to scream to say something, I, 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 and I, I can I can run. So I'm in Savannah, Georgia, and uh, Savannah is a beautiful town, uh, old historic town uh, here in Georgia, and uh, it's a, a great place to visit. We're in a park on the coast called Skidaway uh, State Park, and the first sign you see coming in is against the law to feed the alligators and i'm kind of like you know do the alligators know this it, is this something <laughs> don't mind if i do they know it's against the law to be fed here by human beings i just want to be sure that you know they know that it's a two-way street that we're not going to feed them and they can't eat us george uh, you're down in florida we're getting closer and closer to to george conger's home base how are you doing yeah. Great. We had. We are in the process. We're going to reopen Sunday. Mm -hmm. We had a dry run. We had a funeral on yesterday. We planned for. Uh, we did it outside. Set up 76 folding chairs. Made 100 bulletins, and had 150 people show up. And here's the funny thing: all the chairs were taken except for the front row. <laughs> so so people changed. in the chairs were socially distancing. <laughs> Everybody wore a mask, but. That the, and most people stood against the sides of the church wall, leaned against the church walls to stay in the shade and work mm -hmm. social distancing. But I wasn't worrying about it. That's good. Uh, but you're not, I, gonna, you're I, not gonna be a, a, a super spreader. No, I'm uh, I'm cautiously optimistic. Um, we have loud voices saying predicting the end of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, but then we have more voices saying, I want to get back to normal life. So we'll see how this all turns out, but I'm I'm cautiously optimistic. That's good. Um, lots of things going on in the news. Before we get to that, please, and you guys are really good about this. I don't have to keep reminding you. I just do this to remind myself. Like the show, please. If you see, give us a thumbs up on Facebook or YouTube. That helps the algorithms. It's free advertising for Anglican Unscripted, and we need free advertising to work. We appreciate that. Uh, go to the comment sections. You guys are very faithful about being commenters. Somehow there's always a race to be the first commenter. This isn't about who's first. Okay, guys? I, I want you to know that. But if you are first, we think you're special. That's, that's you know, but there's always a first. We appreciate Kevin, yeah, whenever you yeah. talk about algorithms, I, I always think of Al Gore. <laughs> I, I, I just kept trying to think, you know, what, is there some sort of lockbox where we no, put... Uh, you talk about one person who has no rhythm, it's Al Gore. So I don't know how you, you can compete the, complete the two together. Uh, algorithm is just a hard math that makes a application of itself. Eh, you know, a, a quick explanation for those out there who are not of the engineering mindset. If you don't know what an algorithm is, your life is easier than mine. I, I thought an algorithm was the wise sayings of Vice President Al Gore. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh, we dodged a bullet, didn't we? <sighs> so, um, yeah, politics are in the news. There's lots of Anglican news. Uh, I'm heading south in my RV with my wife. We're in Savannah. We're not too far from Satanfield, Louisiana, George. I thought we'd talk about... Uh, uh, I, it's a hard story to describe, but basically a Roman Catholic priest was caught by a person looking inside his church windows while he was having a sadomasochist sexual encounter with women on the altar. And this is stuff you read about in like a John Grissom book that never really happens in the bayou. But George, it happened in the bayou. The archbishop said, we're going to burn that altar, which is good. And I'm like, how does this happen? How does a person move up through the, the, the chain within the Roman Catholic Church or any church as we've discovered, uh, no denomination is safe, uh, and end up having dominatrix on the altar, George? 
Well, it's the same forces at work that we discussed last week in our joking story about the zombies in Nigeria. In, uh, in a Nigerian Anglican church, three men were arrested digging up, gra digging up graves to procure body parts for ritual cultic or voodoo, as we'd call it in the United States, ceremonies. Mm -hmm. uh, juju men. Right. And they uh, were caught by the police and they're on trial for desecrating graves. It's the same motivation that led a, led a priest of the Roman Catholic Church to desecrate the altar. Um, the story in Louisiana, Pearl River, Louisiana, there's a, a, a priest, it's sort of a modern church building where the front door is glass, so you can look through the front door from the street and see all the way up to the altar. This priest uh, set up lights and film equipment, and he engaged two prostitutes who were uh, specialized in sadomasochism and bondage. One of them uh, built herself as uh, satan tricks uh, and satan tricks. And she uh, said on social media that she had a client and they were going to desecrate an altar this weekend. And a passerby happened to walk past the church and saw all these lights and he looked in and from the street could see these sex acts being performed on the altar by two women and the priest. He, the person called the police, the police came, arrested them for public indecency because, you know, if you do it in a shop front window, even though it's private property, it's, you have no expectation. That's on display. And so the man was arrested for basically a minor low level crime, but the Catholic Archbishop, um, of, of Louisiana, uh, of New Orleans, uh, immediately suspended the priest with the intent to defrock him. And the little investigations, this priest uh, was close friends with another priest in the diocese who had just been suspended for propositioning young boys at a Catholic school. And in fact, this priest who was the pervert on the altar had been hired part time to replace the suspended uh, priest abusing young boys at the Catholic school. And some of the stories that have come out that in the Catholic press is meant this was a young man who was a bit of a dud in seminary and he just, he was one of these guys that always just got the C minus and well we need more clergy so we'll just keep this guy in the system. And he was really into video games and his friends say he was so, he lived the life of video games and that led him into a world of pornography and pornography led him into Satanism. He was seeking to perform satanic ritual black mass acts on a Catholic church altar. And it's the same thing that impelled three men in Nigeria to dig up the bodies of people uh, to perform satanic uh, rituals. Um, to to and, harness the power of evil. I mean, that's what voodoo is. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We can laugh, Nigerian zombie apocalypse, haha. -ha. Oh, of course, it's Louisiana. You know, they're all crazy down there in the bayous. But no, it's not that at all. It's the, it's the reality that Satan is alive and real, and he's at work in these, in these colorful ways in Nigeria and Louisiana. And he's just as much at work if you turn on C SPAN and watch the congressional hearings oh. for. I mean, that's a great example. Here we have uh, Amy Coney Barrett, uh, nominee to the Supreme Court, Roman Catholic, uh, family of seven, perfect mother, has the career to go with it, brilliant, uh, it, from what I can tell. And she is what every uh, woman should, uh, not everyone should, a, a feminist to say, wow, it can happen. You can have a family and eat your cake too. You can have the career. And she is being completely decimated and derided and derailed by the democratic glass ceiling. The liberals in the, in the uh, nomination committee seek to make sure that you understand we don't appreciate you being Catholic. We don't appreciate you being white. We don't appreciate you having a family. And lo and behold, we don't appreciate your interpretation of the Constitution. How dare you sit here before us? Uh, what kind of mad person are you? 
25 years ago, if she sat before this nomination committee, she would have been heralded as the perfect uh, person to put forth here. You are a career woman. You have shown that it can be done. You are what uh, women hope to be, to have their job and a family and uh, be successful. And there are, will be no glass ceiling come on through to the Supreme Court. Um, the, the liberals seem to hate the church, George. They seem to hate success. They certainly hate white. Um, and they hate those who have an original view of the Constitution. It's so hard to watch this. Well, I don't really like to get into party politics Not because I, there are people on both I sides. I don't even know what I'm talking about. Yeah. I, but I'll give you a little brief example. One of the more obnoxious uh, people in, in the Senate is a man named Sheldon Whitehorse, who's the se Democratic senator from Rhode Island. And Whitehorse uh, had 30 minutes uh, to question uh, Judge Barrett. And how many words did. Uh, Judge Barrett say during those 30 minutes? Zero. All Whitehorse did was engage in a prolonged monologue of denouncing her and all these imagined problems. Now, you may remember a story, but if you're really close Anglican ink readers, you remember a story about two years ago where President Trump appointed a man to be a ma federal magistrate, which is sort of the lo lowest level of federal judiciary mm -hmm. uh, where the president appoints. The man happened to attend, I think it was Truro Parish or Falls Church. He was an ACNA member. And Whitehorse, in the confirmation hearings, just went off on this guy for being a member of a church that was homophobic, and misogynist, and in other words, the same sort of nonsense that some of the crazy people are saying about Amy Coney Barrett, that she's a member of some weird cult that every Sunday eats the body of a dead Jewish guy. Whitehorse was basically saying the same sort of things about an ACNA member who's a judge, I mean, a judge appointed. Now, the guy got through, mm -hmm. but where are these, uh, what planet do these people live on, is I think the question I have for myself. Are they just empty suits where their staff write these questions for them, for the TV, uh, to engage, enrage their own political basis? I don't. Well, I think in its most simplest form, it's about power. I have achieved the rank of senator uh, in the most powerful nation in the world. I want to maintain this seat to power. I want to be sure my friends and people who follow me in my footsteps can also have this power. I want to take a $125,000 a year job and walk away with my $25 million. And if I do lose an election, I will be certain to pick up a good lawyer job somewhere where I can be an attorney and a consultant for uh, those seeking to uh, get laws passed on the Hill, and I'll make even more money. And it's really about power. And it, now, no, the right and left is no more innocent in this. When the right has power, it loves and lusts for power. When the left has power, it loves and lusts for the power. We, do, we have it. We don't want to lose it. We'll do anything to keep it. Uh, n no one is innocent in this, but it's it's about achieving the power, having the power, and profiting from the power. Uh, this sickness, which has been in part of politics from the beginning, I guess, has infected the Episcopal Church and the Church of England, and also the Anglican Church of Canada, such that they are now almost indistinguishable from pol party political machines. Mm -hmm. That the initial instincts of some groups that wanted to change teaching on women clergy or on human sexuality, the, those original motives have been subsumed such that now that these some of these people in power, the second generation, if you will, uh, who are not the idealists who started the ball rolling when it was political suicide, career suicide to advocate for this, but they now seek to make impose conformity upon everybody. I mean, this is one of the jokes about the bishops of the Church of England. Uh, amongst them, they don't have a single brain or a single spine. Uh, yet they're bright, capable, competent people, but the way the institution has worked and has trained them is that they're basically supine drones. Uh, 
we did a story last week about the Bishop of Reading. Uh, who, she'd been Archdeacon of Berkshire for a number of years. So this is a woman who basically is a good administrator. And she was elevated to be Bishop of Reading. Um, and then she does a little series of six, eight minute teaching videos. And she talked about creation and she just trotted out this pantheistic nonsense about uh, if people know who uh, Robin Fox are, or Richard Rohr, I mean, G Gaia nonsense. Uh, that, you know, the earth is made in God's image and build this and that. And they create, you know, cre the creation of the world was God's incarnation. Well, no, Jesus. He, he was birthing the world, yes. Yeah, he was, G God was birthing the world. Yes. Um, well, this caused a bit of a ruckus and we covered it and it was a big Twitter storm and the Diocese of Oxford put out a statement, ostensibly written by Bishop uh, uh, Olivia Graham, her name is, but this was not written by Bishop Graham, different language, different cadence from her but, speeches. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Which basically said some members of the social media and on the internet, and, uh, us, <laughs> us. Uh, and others have, uh, have heard her to be saying that she was a pantheist. That wasn't her intention. Rather, her intention was sunshine and roses and daisies. It, I like to teach the world to sing in perfect... Yeah, I know. We know who she is. <laughs> and here's the thing. I wish... This is what I would prefer. I would prefer... Well, my preference is that we, have, we don't have this nonsense. Hmm. But if she really believes it, then she should argue it and defend it and push it. But rather, because this created a, a fracas and made people look stupid, the Church of England basically buried this thing under a fog of, uh, wor under word salad that means nothing. So she still believes what she believes, but the Church of England's uh, media center in the Diocese of Oxford has put out this nonsensical statement that said oh, she didn't mean to offend and we don't have people standing up for what they believe. We have people seeking to protect the institution at all costs. Uh, well, I know. If, that's, if that, pantheism that's, that, is such a good idea, I want to hear the arguments in favor of it. Hold on. Uh, you said protect the institution at all costs. Yes. That's the opposite of what's happening. The institution that is the Episcopal Church, uh, I used to belong to the Diocese of Connecticut, which is, is on the east coast of the United States of America. When I was part of that diocese in 1993 to 2003, it had 179 healthy, you know, middle class, vibrant churches. Since 2003, it has lost 38% of its attendance. It's uh, the people who go to church. They have closed so many churches. They don't talk about it. It doesn't make the papers anymore. It's not news. Uh, it, it's incredible. The, the churches you go through that have been made into little missions or little, you know, they try to keep the doors open. They try to send a minister there every once in a while. But um, it has, for all intents and purposes, the Episcopal Church in Connecticut is dying. They're not trying to save the institution, George. If they would, they would turn back to the Word of God. They would turn back and, and repent from this last 30, 40 years of absolute disastrous teachings. Pantheism and what you heard from the Church of England would be uh, just decimated. But no, they aren't trying to st uh, save the structures. I don't see that. Well, Hillary Clinton, I think, uh, summarized the Episcopal Church's position. Hillary Clinton was on one of the TV shows last week, and she talked about the Methodist Church has declined, losing half of its members since the last 30, 40 years. She says it's because it's not been progressive enough. It's not been liberal enough. Young people walk away because it's not really committed enough to gay rights and the environment and immigration. And Child sacrifice, yeah. dropping and kids in volcanoes. <laughs> It, you know, it's like reading about some of the, uh, you know, reading about these Episcopal hustings up in Canada, for instance, mm. of bishops who are, Canada is actually in worse shape. The Anglican Church of Canada is in worse shape than the Episcopal Church. That will that will flatline a lot sooner. How do we and, know? They won't put their numbers out. 
Right. That's how they'll you know put how out. To... They'll put out these papers through their general synod yes. uh, executive, uh, saying, "Oh, we've got so many years before we're at uh, room temperature." But the uh, reading some of the hustings, uh, you know, diocese of New Westminster and diocese of British Columbia, places, you know, liberal dioceses where you have people campaigning for bishop who are basically saying, we need to do what we're doing, but do more of it. If we only had more Tibetan uh, bowl ceremony singing, if we only had more transgender Eucharists, if we only had more uh, indigenous people's days, then the church will spring back to life. It, one of our readers, uh, viewers, sent me a... Uh, handout, uh, a slide uh, that was used at a Diocese of Oxford uh, clergy uh, meeting. And it wasn't just for regular clergy, it was for the golden boys and girls, sort of the high flyers, about how the National Church is going to rebuild the Church of England. And I'm looking at this thing, and he points out that the words Jesus and Holy Spirit and Christ and Bible and things that you would normally see in a uh, presentation on a church are all absent. And what instead, it's just this horrendous word salad gobbledygook that any sort of management consultant, a 28 year old MBA management consultant from McKinsey would spiel out. Um, and it's absolute nonsense. The, 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 the Church of England has so, the Church of England has picked the worst forms of corporate culture and, and the forms of corporate culture that lead to corporate collapse. They've not picked the entrepreneurial spirit, they've not picked a competition, they've not picked all the things that makes companies successful. They've picked the things that make companies decline quickly as the model for their growth. Pope Francis just wrote that fruity tooty thing, uh, talking about uh, how corporate is the enemy. <laughs> And capitalism is horrible. There's no leadership in the church at, at any level right now. Um, I was reading that uh, Father Tinker is out. Melvin Tinker. I don't think he ever called himself Father Tinker. I'm sorry. On Anglican Unscripted, we go with official titles. I know he's probably <laughs> of the uh, less collar, more tie variety. But uh, yes, Melvin Tinker has uh, left the Church of England, George. St. John's Newlands, his parish, is one of the few success stories in the Church of England, certainly in the Northeast, which mm -hmm. is uh, the more if, is the English version of the Rust Belt uh, we have in the United States. Uh, Melvin uh, grew his church to 500, 600 people plus on a Sunday, which is unheard of in England, uh, just unheard of mm -hmm. uh, in the Church of England. And he withdrew. Uh, he's ret reached retirement age. He left the Church of England ministry. Uh, and he formed a new church, and he took 500 uh, people with him to his new congregation. Uh, there were only 20 people, I'm told, at the church this past Sunday, his old church. Uh, so it's basically a normal Church of England parish yeah, now with 20 people He's returned to the normal, yes. So it's not doing a bad job. It's just, you know, normal now. But Melvin published a paper, which we've printed on Anglican Inc., which spoke for his reasons why. And... I'm, these are my language, this is my words, but as I read Melvin, I'm basically saying is we can't wait any longer uh, for the grand strategies to reform from within or the latest, greatest craze. Because I have real people who I have to deal with on a daily basis who need the power and saving grace of Jesus Christ, and I can't wait on the national institution to get its act together when everything that I've observed over my career of 30, 40 years has told me the opposite is going to happen. Yeah, I, I stayed in tech as long until I got kicked out because I thought there could always be reformation from within. Mm -hmm. um, and that is the preferred course. And at some point, whether, and I'm gonna use a, a business example, your IBM or your Kodak, and you're saying, listen, nobody uses film anymore. Maybe we should change our business model. Uh, nobody's using the old uh, uh, f IBM Main 40 frames. mainframes anymore. Uh, time to change the business model. Uh, people, nobody's coming to your churches. You change the gospel. They don't come anymore. Maybe you want to change it back. Just, I'm just saying. Just saying. And uh, we'll have to but, see what happens with, with Mel. I, I think Melvin will have a lot of success, but... 
if I'm not mistaken, and I say this as an aged person myself, isn't he of the retirement age? Oh, yeah. yeah okay. He's a little older, about 10 years older than we are. Okay. Mid's, mid, he's Gavin Ashenden's age, mid-60s. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, at the same time, the failings, the, the, the failure to think, the, the, the think where success is, is affecting a lot of uh, good ACNA and uh, tech clergy. Sure. Uh, because now that COVID is winding down, at least in the United States, there are a lot of people saying, oh, now we can get rid of these temporary uh, online ministries and outreach, and, the, and we can go back to the way we've always done it. Definitely. And I've got to tell you, folks, that's just, unless yeah. you've got a church of 30 people, mm -hmm. and you know every one of them, and they're going to show up regardless of what you do, you can't go we can't go back we in other words we can't recreate the world in our image we have to take this our job is not to be ritualists or be institutionalists is to share the good news of Jesus Christ and we adopt and adapt our manner of doing this according to the culture in which we live well, I have Kevin and I have a mutual friend who uh, is a missionary and I'm not going to name the country but it's Southeast Asia mm -hmm. And he wrote that because uh, I don't want to get him in trouble with the government. And you, he you're wrote being that, kind uh, enough by saying Southeast Asia. That was very kind of you. He <laughs> could have well, been more specific. Place, Southeast yeah, yeah, Asia, about half yes. a people there. You know? <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, you take your Well, he wrote that the COVID forced foreign missionaries who are not permanent residents of those countries to go home. And one of the what. Hello, Kevin. What are you waiting for? I'm just trying to get the sun out of my eyes. I thought filming outside would be cool, but, you know, we went 27 minutes, and for the sun, that's all it needs is to move into the in, into the sun. But I'll fix this in post. To t talk about our friend. Our mutual friend in uh, the other side of the world was saying that foreign missionaries from Europe, America, other places had to go home because of the COVID uh, lockdown. And one of the things he has observed over the past six, seven months has been the home groups and the local churches that were formed by the foreign missionaries and supported have taken responsibility for their own growth. In other words, the old method of parachuting in clergy, to, and the church exists because the clergy exists there to do it. Uh, when the clergy get pulled out, that model dies, ex unless you teach that it's the job of every Christian to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And what they're seeing in these places where the Western missionaries have been pulled out is that people are multiplying and replicating the Christian faith one at a time, one family at a time, one group at a time, sharing it. And that model that works in the other side of the world will work in the United States. and. The clergy, or thinking of the thinking of the God of the faith of Jesus Christ as being a clergy-driven thing, I think really is a mistaken, uh, untenable way forward. We really need to allow <sighs> unleash the lady. Does that make any sense? Well, it does. I mean, where he's talking about. I'm sorry, we can't tell you where because it, it would be a security issue. Um, there's another thing. That's where uh, the church has become reliant upon itself. The the parishioners rely on the church in COVID times. They rely on the ministries of the church. If they're if they're broken, can't get food, they can get it through the church. They're getting their health care services through the church. They're getting their communication and uh, teaching and the supplies for the children. All that is happening through the church. I I, I take you back and hearken to the. Uh, the United States, with the church was so powerful in the, in the 17th and 18th and, and 19th centuries is because the government was so small and the church was so large and it was existing. And it provided the health care, provided the services, the social services, the returns. Um, and that's why we're seeing this homegrown that's happening in, in Asia is the church isn't just propagating through teaching, it's propagating through being a church. You're, I, I, I so agree with you, Kevin. I Now, perhaps if I were more of a sacramentalist uh, 
who were one of these people that say no bishop, no church, uh, I would be I would think differently. But the growth of the Christian church is taking places where the institutional uh, hold is weakest. And what is strong is is weaker than the faith hold. Mm -hmm. So you're looking like places like China. You're looking. Iran has one of the fastest growing uh, Christian populations in the world. Um, the you know we're reading about Anglicans converts from Islam being arrested by the Iranian government uh, for propagating the Christian faith. Iranian Anglican Christians. I mean, we're talking about words that usually don't all go together in the same sentence. Oxymorons all. Yeah. And instead, we're talking about the Diocese of Connecticut, Anglican Central, collapsing from within. And it's not because everybody's moved to Florida. No. Or is now in an RV like ever. I'm, I'm getting there. It's, it's just that way, down the road south. Gosh, you, you got a bright sun down here. I'm getting sunburned just sitting in it. All right, so we've hit 31 minutes. We appreciate the patience of our audience. Um, there's, uh, I think in the next, certainly up to the election and after that, there's going to be a lot of news, a lot of Christian news, and a lot of Anglican news. So uh, we're trying to return to our twice-a-week recording, doing Tuesdays and Fridays. Uh, this week, George had a funeral, and we do take breaks. We let a clergy take a break for a funeral. Okay, and I'm that's the kind of host I I am. My co-host can take a, a break to, to serve his church because that's how this all works by being the church. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode six hundred twenty-four of Anglican Unscripted. That's like I need SPF ten thousand. Gosh.